moving on to the next category. So we went through EB1, EB1A, EB1C. Tell us a little bit about the EB2 and what that uh, immigrant visa category is all about. So employment-based second preference is for advanced degree professionals and exceptional ability individuals. It can be done with a labor certification. So that would be if you are employer sponsored, or it can be done as a self petition, but you have to argue that, you know, you're eligible to waive the labor certification requirement because the work you do is of national interest. And what that really means is that we have to write, after I prove you either have the equivalent of a master's, so I can do that um, because you have a foreign degree that's the same as master's or you have a US master's, or we can do a combination of education and experience. So like a university degree and five years of experience. We cannot do an experience-based master's. Like you can't do like, I have 16 years of experience, therefore that's a master's. So if we can't do a master's uh, or advanced degree, then we'll argue exceptional ability. And that there's basically six different ways uh, to prove exceptional ability. And you have to establish at least three. The most important, that no matter what we do, if we don't argue it, it's a heavy case, is to show they have 10 years of experience in the field. Then you have to, you could have a degree in the field, you could have a high salary, you could have letters of recommendation, um, you could play a leading role. So there's different cat ways to show that, um, not leading role, that you have certificates or the membership, but there's different ways that you can show exceptional ability and so long as I can document three, I can classify my client as an EB2. And then it's, am I gonna do it with an employer through a labor certification process, which you know is really this preamble to an immigration application. You have to do this app, whole process. The company has to do a whole process with Department of Labor that takes 15 to 18 months where they advertise the same position. They already know they wanna offer the immigrant. They interview all the US workers. They ask the Department of Labor to certify a wage. So there's all these steps they do. It takes 18 months. It costs some money. It's slow. It's annoying. You need to have a really good lawyer that knows how to do it because it's unforgiving. The slightest mistake, it'll get denied. <laughs> so, but that's the typical route for people, right? So if you're an EB2 advanced degree professional, you'll, you'll usually do a labor certification. Now you can't do a labor cert if you own your own business, or if you work in a family business, or if you're a consultant, or if you don't have an employer, but you have the opportunity to work and something to contribute, that's where the national interest waiver comes in. And that's been a tremendous visa opportunity for our clients who are entrepreneurs, who are self-starters, because they'll come in, maybe they were on, a on their student visa, and during their OPT or STEM, they set up a company, and now we do an EB2 self-petition. Maybe the person came in on an L with their own company that they established. They wanna shut down the foreign operations so the EB1 doesn't look like a great option. Or maybe sales have dwindled and the company isn't as robust as it used to be, but it's still, even though it's low employees, still providing a valuable contribution of some sort and impact to the community. Then we can talk about the EB2 national interest waiver. And the same with my E2s. Most of my E2 investors, either their spouse has gone off and gotten work and gotten sponsored to get the green card, or they do an EB2. Because it's not, if you have a successful business, you're not going to quit your job to go be somebody's employee. You want to run your own business. And that's what we- Yeah, generally you're making more money uh, already. So it'd be kind of taking a step back. And there's been, you know, a lot of people were desperate to get green cards and took the chance of, you know, asking a friend to do a labor cert for them. And those cases aren't working because immigration is making, asking those same questions. They're like, I'm looking at your E2, sir. You renewed it last year. You made a million bucks. You expect me to believe you're going to go and work for this guy in a gas station for $50,000 a year? Like, <laughs> doesn't add up. Right. So, you know, there's the government's still smart, might be bureaucratic, but they're logical. And, yeah. uh, and so I tell clients all the time, I'm like, listen, if you've got a viable business and you can structure it self petitioning on the EB2 with a national interest waiver, it's golden. And if you have a degree and we can argue advanced degree, even better if it's a STEM science, technology, engineering, and math, those cases have been getting approved with very little problem. Very cool. What are, what are some things that kind of like boost up the case? Like 
that they wrote a book, have articles, they have an amazing website. What are some yeah. things that can really boost that EB2 NIW case? I think it's every person is different, right? Sure. I think the EB2 NIW, I mean, every lawyers differ on how they present their cases and their strategies. And, you know, I, we do a lot of these now. Um, we've done a lot in the last two years. I think we've our last count, um, I'm not as prolific as my good friend, Carmen, who's amazing at these, but you know, we've done about 200 of them with like an 87% approval rate. Oh. And um, it's in the last two years, we were kind of waiting to see how the uh, how the Danisar standard played out for a few years, because I didn't want to rush and put clients in jeopardy. You know, we've, We've done a lot of labor search, so that was always, you know, the route we took with clients or EB1. But with Danisar, it really opened up and we've seen tremendous success with the EB2 NIWs. I'm just a little um, old school in that I think every case is different and I try to tell a story. Yes. And I, the way I see it is this national interest waiver standard is completely, completely subjective, right? It's whether or not that guy in the cubicle in Nebraska or Texas who like, you know, is not getting paid very well and is looking at a ton of paper all around him. Do I catch his eye? And does he think that what my client does is of, you know, Nash, substantial merit and national importance? How do I present that? And every client is going to have their own unique contribution. So qualifying them as advanced degree or exceptional, that part's easy. How I talk about that individual's work and their impact, that's where the case is made, right? And how do I show it? It's very different. For some people, it'll be letters from very uh, well-known individuals in the field. For someone else, it might be their impact is more social community in the community. So then I'm not talking about um, getting letters from corporate people, but more from community leaders talking about impact. Maybe this person is their their contribution is in the arts. The package then would be more visual. And I would try to highlight what that client does to give the, the, the reader a sense of connection to my client. Because since it's a subjective standard, I have to appeal to that person's yes. interest somehow. So every case is really different. And I would say the more unique your case is, the more it stands out, kind of like the EB1A, the better chances you're gonna have. If your case looks cookie cutter like 10 others that they read last week, it's not gonna stand out. And it's gonna be, I think, harder to get that petition approved. And right now, if someone's residing in the US, they could do premium processing in 45 days and know the decision on EB1A, EB1C, or EB2, NIW, is that correct? Yes, it's awesome. Yeah. And then on the EB3 and the EB2 with labor cert, the labor cert's taking about 18 months, and then you can file the I-140 and you'll have a response in 15 days. But I tell clients, you know, if you're going to do a labor cert, you need to have, and you want to do it from the U.S., you need to have status of at least two years when you start the labor certification process, because otherwise you're not going to be able to adjust and continue Bridget. working. <laughs>